Good afternoon, everybody. Um, colleagues of the Institute of Gender and Development Studies, and of course, of the Institute of International Relations, members of the UE communities, um, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd like to especially welcome um, members of the Trinidad and Tobago CEDAW Committee. I saw, I noticed some people there. Um, and of course, our guest speakers. Um, I'm Jessica Byron. I'm the director of the Institute of International Relations, and I'm very happy to welcome all of you to this afternoon's special guest lecture on the theme, Integrated or Evaporated, a long-term perspective on gender equality norms in global governance. We are still in the month of March, an International Women's Day was celebrated a few weeks ago. And therefore I'm particularly pleased that we are having this lecture today and that we are welcoming Dr. Susan Zwingel, visiting Fulbright Scholar at the UWI Institute for Gender and Development as our feature speaker. Greetings, Dr. Zwingel, and thank you very much for contributing and collaborating with the IIR and for sharing your gender and international relations expertise with our community today. Warm greetings also to Ms. Roberta Clark, advocate for social justice and gender equality and member of the Inter-American Committee, Commission for Human Rights, who will give a commentary to launch the discussion after Dr. Zwingel's presentation. Roberta, welcome back to the IAR. You're a good friend and it's always a pleasure to have you in our midst. Today's lecture is particularly timely, coming towards the end of our long tunnel, journeying through our battle with COVID-19. During the last two and a quarter years, gender equality aspirations and the protection expectations for women, girls, and many vulnerable sectors in our world have gone backwards, have been dealt crushing blows. Gender-based violence in the Caribbean has soared alarmingly, and women have been among the worst affected by the economic sh shutdowns and the other restrictions under which we have lived during the pandemic. And maybe today we'll have the chance to reflect on such situations and how we can seek to remedy them within the context of today's lecture. And so without further delay, I will now introduce Dr. Zwingel formally, and um, then we'll proceed. Dr. Suzanne Zwingel is Associate Professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at one of our um, collegial universities, Florida International University. Her research interests are women's human rights and their translation, women's movements and public gender policies around the world, global governance and gender, and feminist and post-colonial IR theories. She has authored um, Translating International Women's Rights, the CEDAW Convention in Context. And she has been co-editor a few years before that of Feminist Strategies in International Governance. Um, these are very important recent works of Dr. Zwingel. And she's published in a number of edited volumes including, and journals, including International Feminist Journal of Politics, the International Studies Quarterly, Social and Economic Studies from UWI, and Third World Thematics. And she's currently working on transnational gender norm translation in South Florida and the Caribbean. Once again, Dr. Zwingel, a very warm welcome to you. And um, 
we look forward to your presentation and the discussion after it. I will be a little more expansive on Ms. Clark um, just before her commentary. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if I'm already. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Byron. And also thank you um, for the invitation to speak here in the context of the Institute for International Relations at BUE. Thank you to all the staff who have taken so good care of me throughout this process. I also would really like to thank the Institute for Gender and Development Studies who's hosting me while I'm here on my Fulbright, which is, you know, is some context in work. Huh? Um, of course, Roberta Clark, for her insights here today, I'm really, really looking forward to that. And to all of you here in the audience who make time this afternoon to listen to what I have to say. Thank you very much. I'm very honored that you're going to share my screen now. Can you see this well? And I hope so. Yes. All right. And uh, Dr. Professor Byron was already so nice to introduce myself and my title. So um, you are getting from me today is a long-term perspective on gender equality norms in global governance. On the side here, you see an image of to which I have contributed and the, the article that I have contributed is what I'm gonna draw on today for this um, presentation. This came out of a um, collaboration with the Danish Institute for International Studies and the editors are Lars Engel Peterson, Adam Fierskov and, and Sine Marie Cold Ruff Kilian of volume, which is called Gender Equality in Global Governance, the Delusion of Norm Diffusion. So there's a little bit of a critical tilt to it, as you can see, um, so, you know, some, some broad and by now very powerful paradigm of norm diffusion within relations as a discipline. And so before we go there, before we go to the actual um, content, I just wanted to um, share two snapshots with you that I came across lately. So, um, you know, gender equality norms, it, sometimes I think, of course, we always have this Full glass half empty perspective. It seems, um, especially if we look sort of long term, that this is a, is, these are, is a set of norms that many people can agree with, or at least partly can agree with. It seems there has been a lot that has happened in the last um, decades, right? So is it a global success story? So I just found you two uh, contemporary snapshots. The first one is from the um, Economic Policy Institute, which is a think tank in the US um, very recently, which report states the gender pay gap narrowed very significantly between 1999 and 1994, here from 37.7% to 23.2. Um, the reasons are another issue, but let's, let's just say for now that um, there was a significant narrowing but not since then, if you look at this. So between 1994 and 21, 2021, pay gap always remained. So that's sort of an interesting thing if you if you are all so much in favor, right? And um, why are some realities so persistent and um, don't seem to change? And the other snapshot I also just came across, this is a 2020 report um, produced by UNDP social norms, a game changer for gender inequalities. They detect in this norm what they call an inequality plateau, where they see that in some areas of gender, the, the progress is slowing or actually reversing, so things are getting more difficult. To figure out why that is, they um, constructed the what they call the gender social norm index, which comes from the World Value Survey question, so it has a very broad um, geographical and they, they construct this index and they, and I'm going to spare you the technicalities of how they did that, but is that there's actually only a very percentage of men and women, I think it's like 10% men and 13% women who do not display any gender bias. 
And whereas 50% think that men are better political leaders, 40% think then that they make better business executives, and then think that it's justifiable under certain conditions for men to beat their partner. And you can imagine that um, in women, there is some difference, so it, it, a little lower on that, the men a little higher, but um, it is a pretty substantial part of people who, you know, kind of not. I hope, and um, you can hear me still, it, it says to me right now that I have unstable internet connection. If, if it becomes difficult, please give me a sign or something and I will gladly repeat anything, okay? And um, so of this, um, so we have, we see how, how deeply ingrained um, gender norms are, and you know, all norms that are close to how we live, not only um, related to gender, related to race relations, um, class, this is something that's very close to, to us, right? And that's, of course, um, um, you know, it's very much uh, ingrained in our daily lives, and it takes very long to produce behavioral change on a level that goes beyond just, you know, approval of a certain norm and substantive change um, that follows that kind of new norm, right? Now, um, the question do global governance institutions contribute to that or can help with that? Sometimes it feels they're perhaps a little far away to um, create change like that, but of they have engaged in that for a long time. And so the topic for me today is to look into how they have done this and what we can observe there, right? And um, just, just to go back for a moment to the book that I mentioned in the beginning, which I contributed here, what we wanted to do is um, to create a situated approach to norm research, meaning um, we wanted to go away from an idea which sometimes floats around a little bit in IR scholarship, that norms are powerful or not, right? Um, as if they were floating around um, in a way. And what we wanted to do is to go to the actors and agents that actually work on bringing up norms, making them um, productive, posing them, right? So um, um, actors who really work with norms, and um, also um, contextualize this work, um, um, you know, depending on where this where this, this activism takes place in a way, right? So the, the the entire volume looks at global. My focus was a little bit narrower on organization, um, on international organizations, the United Nations, right? A global governance can, can be, of course, constructed much broader, and you can think of regional organizations. You could um, think of and border crossing um, 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 processes that are not directly related to international, but I, United Nations. And um, I just wanted to say that in my work, usually I look more at how global normative frameworks can be, right? Because many of those global frameworks, they are made to be used elsewhere, right? And so you have this global multilateral agreement and then the idea is that states and societies within their preferences and, and capabilities use those frameworks to um, trigger change, right? So in other words, the framework um, don't fulfill the entire purpose, right? So, um, and usually I look into these translation processes, but I think it's also very, very important to pay attention to what happens within um, an organization like the UN because it's just simply not the case that a framework, for example, is set up and then it only has to be implemented. As you will see throughout the um, presentation, there's a lot of movement back in stalemates and, and, and all those kinds of things. And I think the way um, norms develop over time is something that um, in this particular context is important to pay also understand why or why not um, they are applied in other or work. So um, again, this is only one space that I'm looking at in, in this network um, of sites or contexts through which norms may or may not be fused. It's important to have in mind. I'm not trying to say like the UN is the most important space. That's not the idea. Um, and I just also um, wanted to quickly explain why I put those images. Um, this is, um, if you have been in sites, I guess, um, pre-COVID, we went there personally, right? So 
you know how uh, how this world is, looks like. And you, you sit in you sit in conference rooms and talk to each other typically through translators or listen to what is being said through translation. And that is how the work of the Yen is produced. That's how documents are produced. That's how frameworks are produced. And this up here, I just I also wanted to add this because um, people from many parts of the world go to you know those in Geneva or in, in, in New York or where else. And of course, you bring your electronic device come from different places that, that need adapters to actually connect to the, to the grid in those places. And I thought this was a very nice um, image for you know, what it means to, you know, the, the preconditions necessary to get that globally, so to say. Okay, and also I just wanted to juxtapose this with the of the UN General Assembly, which usually is, is something that we associate with um, the UN, right? But I think there are so many other um, spaces that that explain perhaps even better what the UN looks like, these sort of connections. Okay, um, so let me look at the UN, the development within the UN of um, gender norm development. I also just wanted to say that when I talk about the UN, I'm thinking about a three dimension following Tom Wise in that, a very important UN scholar who says on the one hand, I mean, this is a space where states um, uh, come together and um, create multilateral solution to problems, even if of course, as we know, this is often very difficult. So it's a, a space, a state defined space, but of course the UN is also its own institution some semi-independence um, also. Of course, there's a lot that states decide, but there's also and all the um, um, organization, there's a lot of um, agency and space for agency for the end itself. And then thirdly, we also have a large, um, comparatively large um, space for civil society organizations and increasingly also uh, private sector actors to um, give input even if there's no formal membership, as you know. It's important to have this, this in mind, I think. Um, okay, and what I wanted to do, um, and just to sort of explain this um, quickly, and then I have more time, I wanted to explain the sort of the general contexts in which gender norm development has taken place over those three periods of time, and talk about the were relevant in each of those time frames. Okay? And then I'm looking at in these exact, exact same time spaces, norms, because I, I, I thought it entangled them a little bit. Um, and the first two, the first two norms, so if it's, uh, they come in two, two steps, the first two norms on gender equality and political participation and in economic development, they are, um, I cluster them together because they have focused more traditionally on public life, okay? I want to influence there. And the other three norms I'm gonna look at quickly are um, a little bit different. They also typically have come up later because about um, um, questioning and criticizing the divide between public and private and bring in the necessity to focus on private life to fully understand the forms of discrimination against women and to um, reach towards gender equality. Right? And uh, one here is the broader um, frame of women's rights. And then we have a focus on violence against women and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Now, just um, before I move, um, uh, one or two points I wanted to make. Um, the, the first one is, of course, these are not all gender equality norms that have um, been debated or framed or created on the global level. There's some others that I have left aside. Um, for example, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is a very important one that has come up rather late. Um, and there are others that could be named. Um, so, you know, this is not about um, completion, it's more about tracing process in those areas. Is <laughs> the time frame is a little lacking, I think, because you know, when I when I wrote this chapter that was pre-COVID, and so I just did 1995 to present. Now I feel like maybe COVID is a space in which um, new paradigms, uh, like a sort of a new frame that we have to look at separately, right? And Dr. Barry mentioned this in the introduction also. So I'm gonna have a few thoughts on that, but I think that's also certainly up for debate what you think about that. All right, so um, to, 
you know, come together, understanding those broad dimensions. The UN, um, of course, was founded in 1945. And um, as you know, there were um, predecessor organizations, but I'm just going to leave this out for now. So if you, oh, and one other thing I wanted to say. So these, the, the, the three timeframes that are used here, they really um, have a lot to do with this one, the middle one, because that one was so um, important for the global women's rights and gender equality frameworks, right? The frame through the women's conferences, as you know. And so the, the first one in the, if you think about generally speaking, those first three decades of the UN, of course, the UN is a, the idea is to um, preserve world peace, right? But we are in a, in a constellation of the Cold War that's a stalemate for any demilitarization efforts, really. So there's a lot of focus instead of on um, co collaborating uh, economic development, development uh, models and frameworks, and also to support decolonization processes. It's also a time, of course, when the UN grows very much in terms of membership, as you know. Um, and sort of moving on just to this time, general time frame that we have that in mind, um, you know, this the beyond the Cold War statement and then um, coming in with decolonization, we have this three word structure um, up until the end of um, block the late 1980s, early 1990s, which really I think creates a space and that's very important for the women's um, uh, rights related actors. Um, it's a space that, that allows a lot of um, anti-hegemonic um, and coalition building and um, you know a strong critique of, of a capitalism that it's very strongly tilted towards the um, geopolitically powerful actors in the multilateral system. In mind, I mean this time also falls, as I said, the end of block confrontation and at the same time we have the start of um, the neoliberal sort of paradigm shift in the development world where we have a market-oriented uh, paradigm and a sort of a retrenchment of welfare state policies. This hits um, the developing world more in this time than the developed world, I would say, but certainly in the later part in this last year, it also becomes very relevant in, um, develop, in developed states. So we have by now, unfortunately, um, this increasing um, tendency of rising economic disparity. So that has become worse. We also have in this time a rise of fundamentalisms. Initially, I think, um, you know, people described that um, the September 11 was, of course, one element of that decade in the 1990s, which was very open to multilateral processes, comparatively speaking, certainly after the end of the Cold War, right? Um, and in, in reaction to that, then we also have a lot of um, militarization and security, securitization processes. Unfortunately, again, I, um, I kept thinking of how long this last phase should be, right? I think actually all those developments, they have um, continued. I mean, we have now that maybe weren't so in the early, um, uh, in the first decade of the 20, 21st century, but now we have illiberal democracies. We have, of course, um, the uh, development in Russia as we, witnessed them right now, um, we have all kinds of um, rising fundamentalisms that um, make multilateralism much more difficult, right? And we also have increased militarization and securitization. So that seems to have stayed the same, unfortunately. And again, um, COVID, um, again, another um, increase in, in terms of economic disparities. Okay, and if we then think about the um, women specific actors throughout those phases over time. So in the in this first phase, the UN is really not an actor that pays much attention to gender issues. I mean, there's very little reference in the charter, as you know, and we have a very early um, foundation of the Commission for the Status of Women. So there is something there, but marginal um, um, initiative in, um, in this organization that peace and development rather, um, you know, without a gender lens, really, right? States do not, do not yet take responsibility. Some uh, exceptions we have, as you know, certainly within the Caribbean and also, for example, among the um, Nordic states, but it's in general speaking, if you think about the world as a whole, states are not very um, responsive to gender equality claims. 
And also in the US, UN, you have very little administrative um, support structures at all. And then you come into this um, phase here, these two decades from 1975 to 1995, which really change everything, I think, in terms of awareness regarding women's um, discrimination and um, gender hierarchies. Um, and really mostly due to the, the World Women's Conferences, um, these global spaces that draw on the knowledge of women's organizations and also government actors in this area, but also which help trigger more um, feminist and women's organizations to actually be created and make this a much louder choir of voices okay, in this time to think about what it means to um, think of women as, you know, having the exact same rights as men and pay and paying attention to the work that they do and what status they deserve and so forth. So this becomes a very um, important time frame for women's um, concerns. We also have many more governments becoming supportive of gender equality issues. So we have the um, increasing creation of women's political machineries. Um, as I said, we also have more um, input from civil society organizations into these global debates and also not only in the global debate, particular context. And then we have in the UN also institution building with UNIFEM, INSTRA, CEDAW Convention is also part of that time. And then finally, the last um, um, cluster at the time um, segment here, I think we have, a, again, this uh, forward backward movement, right? On the one hand, we do have a consolidation of those claims. I mean, Beijing has this very strong mandate, for example, of gender mainstreaming within the UN and also beyond. Um, um, a time where the CEDAW Convention, which um, is uh, created in the late 1970s, but for a long time, not very um, integrated in the human rights system and also otherwise not very visible, becomes actually a much more important um, uh, framework and, and instrument, right? And I think that has that is still the case. So we have this um, uh, a strengthening of that. We also have later on the foundation of UN Women. So this is all a institutional upgrading right of um, responsibilities and, and commitment towards gender equality claims on the other hand we also have a growing opposition towards gender equality claims we have increasing um i mean not that they weren't existing before right obviously um when the claim of gender equality women's rights when that first came up of course this was against um, opposition, right, and against um, sort of traditions opposed to that. But again, in this in this um, phase, I think there was some some reshuffling there. Lately, we have more of a growth of opposition to gender equality claims under this umbrella of anti-feminism or also criticism of gender ideology of um, you know threats to the natural family. And it's really quite interesting. Um, I read a an, an, an very interesting article by Anne-Marie Götz about that, where she says this, these um, coalitions here that under this um, umbrella, they actually don't have much in common, except that they're all against feminism and, and against feminist claims, right? So that's this um, uh, glass half, full half, empty situation. I think also, again, this is, yeah, this is in full swing. There's, this is problematic for a space like the UN to have that much um, Opposition to gender equality claims were, um, a, a, you know, the, the strengthening of, of the within the UN. There's a strengthening of this position with UN and many other things. Of course, I also just as a footnote, I just want to say that the UN in itself is not a gender neutral space. It's an institution that has a long tradition of androcentrism, right? Um, but I think it's it's um, dealing with that and it's um, trying to work through those. Issues. Of course, one thing that we haven't seen yet is, for example, a, a female secretary general, but there is um, growth in female representation. Um, so there is, there is, a, right, but there's also resistance. So we have this glass half full, half empty situation. All right. Okay, let me um, then move on and maybe um, let's do this a little bit faster through them um, to move on to those. Um, uh, specific um, norms that I wanted to sort of trace through those spaces and times and spaces. So those two, as I said, um, um, women's access to political 
representation in it and in development, economic, social economic development, have the older type of norms, right? And they have focused more strongly on the political position of women. And if I'm thinking about this um, norm here, um, women in terms of political participation, I think what we see is sort of a broadening and also a substantiating of that norm because you have in the first time frame, um, you know, the demand is for women to have legal equal participation because they didn't have that in many countries in the world, right? So there's a lot of legal changes, a lot of conventions to that to that um, effect. Of course, what, what, what becomes clear is that the legal opening isn't really helping women to get the recognition and the respect and the standing and also the, the I guess, um, self-respect to actually participate as much in political um, decision-making as men. So in this area, I think is the broader um, empowerment of women beyond formal politics in, or in movements, right, in, um, in networks, in feminist networks, to realize what, what, what this androcentrism in politics actually is all about, right? And there's a lot of broader empowerment. And um, with Beijing, again, also has to do with gender mainstreaming, I think, um, again, a reorientation towards more formal politics and towards the need of also more, more specific techniques, I think, for, to get women actually in those, um, in those um, official spaces. And one very important technique is the use of electoral quotas, gender quotas, where women get um, through different strategies actually get a um, the guaranteed a higher representation in political decision making. That is, I have to say, it's a very um, has been a very um, successful strategy. If you think between ninety five and now, globally speaking, a rise of women parliamentarians from ten percent to twenty five percent, which is significant. Of course, as you can say, 25% is still um, far away from gender equality in political decision making. And also, um, I think um, more recently, what we see is backlash against women in um, in um, political positions, in you know, that stand up for particular particular positions. Um, we have a lot of violence against women in the form of politics. We also have um, violence and even murders of of women. Um, uh, human rights defenders. So there is, um, even if I would in general describe this norm as a relatively successful one and one that has become more substantive so that women can actually get all those tools to, to actually become um, represented in, in politics. And um, we have that, but I think also we see some kind of effect there. And the um, of gender issues and uh, the uh, equal representation of women in socioeconomic development, again, very early topic within the UN. Uh, also one that has been very much pushed by um, newly independent states. I think you uh, know that all very well, right? So they, they focus on the role that women play in socioeconomic development, the particular needs they also may have in distinction from men, they just the gendering, the gender sensitivity of what it means to um, who work for the well-being of the entire population, uh, the population including women, which in, includes things like equal access to education and all kinds of employment. So that was a very early, um, clear focus, I think, of the UN. And then we have, again, in this middle phase, I think, a uh, substantiation of that, I think. I mean, there's more, um, and this, I think, um, a lot of that comes from um, civil society organizations, this push to say, um, we have to make, macroeconomic structures. We cannot do little things, uh, extra things for women. We have to really think gender into macroeconomics. Of course, Dawn and also organizations like CAFRA, they were very important for that, right? To say, okay, if we have a tilted economic system that benefits the already most powerful, then let's rethink it from the perspective of the most marginalized, which are women from the global south, right? And that kind of rethinking, um, and also in this, in this framework of um, women's empowerment, very much understood as a collective move, not as an individual choice idea, right? That I think really made this um, development paradigm very, very substantively gender sensitive. However, if you remember, all of this takes place in um, a context of increasing neoliberalization, right? Which um, is of course um, problematic for the most vulnerable. And I think um, what we see in the last phase is really a, um, 
um, a move towards making this idea of women's empowerment, of economic um, um, contribution, it becomes more neoliberalized, more superficial in a way, where all of a sudden the, the focus is not anymore on the well-being of, of families, communities, uh, women, children, men, and, and so forth, but it's really about making women um, contributors to social growth because, um, I'm sorry, economic growth, because that's that's the goal, right? And then the idea is the trickle-down effect about um, making women employable, um, train them to, to become economically active. And the, the, the context for that and the surroundings and the um, uh, downfalls of this kind of market focus and um, becomes a, a false by the wayside a little bit. So we have a neoliberalization, I would say, of that, of that um, um, norm in the, in the last phase. We do also have other dimensions. We have, for example, gender budgeting as a, as a new tool, which I think is very interesting in terms of uh, making gender mainstreaming um, substantive in, in governmental policies. I'm not so sure, however, how much it has caught on personally. I'm, I'm not, that's not my, um, my area of expertise. I would love to hear if anybody knows more about that. Okay, so those were the two more public focused norms. And then let me quickly look at these here, which are much more about um, public and private spaces and what 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 the the framings of those do to the position of women. So the broader women's rights framework, um, I think really starts more in the second phase. So we have in the first phase something like a concept of what discrimination against women is, but it's it's you know it, a, a female focus is not yet part of a human rights cannot say that. That um, really starts with CEDAW um, in the late 1970s. And you know, the CEDAW convention, the CEDAW committee actually works in the 1980s and starts to work. So that's when, when things happen to change. And I think that through the work of, of the CEDAW committee, we have um, very important um, developments here in this area, really starting in the early 1990s, where we have um, a, a much better understanding due to the work um, about what substantive equality be between men and women means, really much, much, much beyond, you know, um, legal um, equality, a jury de facto um, discrimination. We have a very broad and rich understanding of intersectional discrimination, where it's very, very important to look at women in their difference, right, in their um, combination, where gender um, hierarchies intersect with many other um, possible hierarchies, could be class hierarchies, race hierarchies, disability um, hierarchies, could be sexual identity and, and gender identity. All of those things is something that becomes more of sort of an enrichment into this um, framework of women's rights. And it's, it's really interesting to see this now and think that at the beginning, CEDAW wasn't understood as a human rights instrument, but rather as a development tool. So that took a long time. And of course, um, what's also important for the human rights framework is this dimension of state responsibility. So it's not only Right, that women and men should have should live in substantive equality, but states actually have a responsibility to work towards that goal. That's a very helpful frame. Both violence against women, I think, and sexual and reproductive health and rights have sort of benefited from this um, broadening of women's rights of this understanding. As you can see, um, violence against, against women as a norm wasn't really anything of a global issue first phase, but becomes so in the second one. Again, the um, um, uh, women's conferences are very important for that. Um, the um, bottom-up knowledge of many, many women's organizations from many parts of the world bring a lot of understanding of um, violence against women in its many different forms, domestic, public, communal, right? And this is the time where slowly you get this understanding of violence against women as a global also as a fundamental human rights violation, which then means the state actually has responsibilities to work against it. So that's a very, very important paradigm shift, I think. And I think in the last um, time frame here, we have um, a broadening of this notion. We had now we said we talk about gender-based violence. So this is all violence that is committed because of gender stereotypes or gender assumptions, right? So this um, affects women very fundamentally, but also affects gender non 
affects men in, in, in certain ways. So there's a lot of um, understanding of what, it, of what it is. It has become broader. But I think there's also a, a move towards narrowing, which is a focus on female victimization and the, the need of protection for women specifically, right? Which I think, interestingly, makes this a more acceptable norm because it aligns with a lot of sort of more traditional um, ideas of, of gender relations, right? If this is um, useful, and um, I think there's a problem here with going to the causes of, of violence against women. Sometimes I also feel like the, the strength of the women peace and security agenda has also somehow moved a little bit in this direction where it's less about um, the participation of women in solving conflicts and, and, and um, you know, leading, uh, leading them to peace, but more about the specific experiences of women in conflict um, and the sexual violence, right? So which, of course, is a very important dimension, but I think it could also be a sort of, um, um, sort of a sort of a stereotypization, perhaps I could say, of this broad phenomenon of violence against women or gender-based violence. And finally, sexual and reproductive health and rights, you know, one could say has very early origins in the uh, in population policies of the 1950s, 60s, 70s already. So the idea that birth control helps with, um, you know, reducing un unwanted um, um, reproduction or, you know, there it was uh, actually at that time a framework that wasn't so interested in the self-determination of women, but more in a broader context. Of course, this can be very strongly criticized and still is by many um, voices against it. But I think in the second phase here, it becomes really more that a, a, a very strong discourse to think about um, um, the self-determination of women as to their sexuality and their wishes to reproduce and their reproductive health, right? And has broadened a lot and has been a very, very important um, dimension of the whole gender equality um, fabric, I would say. However, and of course, it's still, you know, it has a lot of proponents um, even um, in this later phase, also the full reductive auto autonomy of women, but it has attracted from very early on those anti-feminist positions that I talked about earlier. I mean, they were early on more religiously infused. I think this has broadened out quite a bit right now, right? Um, religion, of course, different types of religion play a very important role in this. So we have, this is a, a norm, I think, which has actually from the get-go been very contested and um, has been very, very difficult to find common ground on that one. I think what then happens within the context of global governance institution is they, they are not intending to join a side, but they try to find a space within this uh, normative um, context where they can do something that is perhaps not contentious. So there is a stronger focus on working towards maternal health and maternal mortality prevention. Sex education, I think, was also pushed um, a little bit more into the space of, you know, that's, that's something that even people who are against um, um, access to contraception and even abortion could live with. So that's also something that was a very important space for the UN. Um, but in general, I think this is a little bit of a stalemate situation and um, seems to stay that way. Of course, there are several other um, norms that we could also talk about where that is the case. And one, one very interesting one, I think, where even different self-declared feminist group cannot really learn much is and the prostitution versus sex worker rights and health debate, right? So that's a, um, also something that we could talk about, but I didn't include here for reasons of time. Okay. Um, yeah. Again, I mean, I haven't really um, talked very much about the um, the COVID situation, the COVID influences, how, how that could, could change things. If you think about all those five norms that I've talked about now, I think there could be, some influence on the socioeconomic um, development um, um, norm that I talked about to the degree that it's perhaps a norm that becomes less focused on um, you know, public um, gainful employment, but it takes in a more um, um, comprehensive view on the importance of reproductive labor and what we call now um, you know, the essential work that we have learned is necessary 
is to function during the pandemic. So that would be an interesting opening. So perhaps there's even some reason for optimism, right? The other thing I think um, that we have looked at much more during the pandemic is violence against women, gender-based violence, which is again something that some of that, the domestic dimension of, of violence against uh, gender-based violence is something that's often very hidden from sight. There has been a little more of that visible and, and, and talked about and due to the um, pandemic. So maybe there's also something that we as a global community, if you want, um, take more responsibility for the things that happen in private. That would be a very important thing for the furthering of women's rights and gender equality. I think that's interesting. All right, um, let me close up. Um, I think I also have gone on for quite a while. <laughs> okay, so what you could see is there was not, not really a linearity in the evolution of those norms. They sort of go back and forth, but I just wanted to tease out a few dynamics that I think are relevant. And number one, so you have to really launch those norms, right? So someone has to bring those in. They don't just come up by themselves. Most of the time, we have seen that civil society organizations, often with very interesting strategies through transnational networking and so forth, have been the ones who have done this work. And then oftentimes states have followed or you know, UN bureaucracies also have picked things up and, and, and them or perpetuated them, but that's very important. Those things don't come up by themselves. It hasn't happened. Um, we saw the different temporality of norms that that you know some some norms come up earlier, some later. It has a lot to do with who pushes them and who's there, the norm entrepreneurs, right? And if you have supporting norms or not, I think again, I think the human rights, women's human rights framework has been very useful to make it better understood, for example. Right? And then what's also important is the broader institutional factors. I think the, the de-radicalization, one could say perhaps, of, of economic empowerment for women and what this means has a lot to do with the broader neoliberal um, reinforcement um, you know, of, the, of the general global system. So that, it didn't go together, those two, I don't think. And we have seen evolution for all those norms. So none of them come up and then stay the same. They are being pushed in different directions, right? So as I said, I think um, political participation has become more um, broadened um, and more comprehensive. And um, violence against women, gender-based violence, I think both broader and in some degrees at least de-radicalized, I think a little detached from what are the context factors, what are the causes for that, right? And then finally, as I said, um, economic empowerment, um, women's economic empowerment, and I think has become um, very flattened and co-opted. Again, perhaps the pandemic is an opening to, under, to come back to a broader understanding of what women's economic um, activities and status and involvement actually looks like. And then finally, um, as I said, some norms stay pretty controversial. They, are, they have this pushing back and forth and leads, that leads to a, uh, in the uh, international organization, to a strategy to find some common ground, right? And see if you can, if that can be expanded. I think that's fair to say, because there's no, the, the, the international organization per se is not interested in um, taking sides in a conflict. Okay, I think this is all I have for you. Thank you very much for your attention, for your long time span attention, I should say. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Zwingo. Um, I think it's been a very interesting tour through the how the evolution of gender norms have really um, progressed during the past 50, 60 years, so, more, um, 70 years of the United Nations existence. And um, the emphasis, which is often driven by different ideologies, political ideologies, and specifically gender ideologies at different times. Um, I am now going to um, say a little, a few words of introduction uh, about Roberta Clark, who is going to start off our discussion with a brief commentary. Um, 
Well, I've told you already that Roberta has a long history of activism, um, both on gender equality and on other themes of social justice. And she's currently a commissioner of the Inter-American Commission for, Commission for Human Rights um, from 2022 to 2025. Now, she has previously had quite a long history of work with UN women. She was head of UN women offices in East and Southern Africa, Libya, Asia and the Pacific, and in the Caribbean. And until December 2021, she was the chair of the executive committee of the International Commission of Jurists. And before being at the United Nations, Roberta was a lawyer practicing in Trinidad and Tobago, and she has also worked with CAFRA, the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action. Um, so Roberta, welcome again. And um, we'll start with your commentary before um, everybody else gets involved. Over. Thank you very much, Professor. And um, uh, thank you very much to doc Dr. Zungel for her her paper, um, her thoughts, and uh, welcome and good afternoon to everyone in virtual land. Um, I, uh, Dr. Zingel, I, I read the the parts of I read the paper that you sent me in the book, and uh, and it, um, and of course I have to read the whole book. But thank you very much for sharing that with me. And one of the things that struck me, many things that struck me in your paper, but I'm going to do a, a quote what you've said almost at the beginning of your paper. Uh, which I think is, is, is your central thesis. And you say, while gender equality norms have clearly changed the agendas and the bureaucracies of previously gender unaware international organizations, they are nonetheless often co-opted, subordinated, or even ignored. And I understand, and I have to say, confess, I share that anxiety. We live in an equal world, both you and, and uh, Professor Byron have already uh, alluded to that, a highly unequal world where, where the intersecting inequalities continue to deprive women and girls of voice, choice, and safety, and trap men and boys in harmful, destructive, and restrictive gender stereotypes and roles. We live in a world of existential peril right now. We live in a world of pandemic, we live in a world of aggression, war, and conflict, all of which have exacerbated the impacts on women living at the intersections of those inequalities, whether those intersections are within or indeed between countries. And I think that between countries is very much part of that core dynamics that we have to engage with when we talk about um, diffusion, norm diffusion, um, or norm cooptation. And so we ask ourselves today, as you've been asking us, um, can the UN system, can the multilateral system make a difference? Or the, 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 the question which was asked by my former colleagues, Joanne Sandler and Anne-Marie Getz, to whom we referred, can the, the, can the UN deliver a feminist future? So I want to, get, to give a spoiler and give my answer at the beginning and then work back from my answer. I want to say, yes, I think the multilateral system, the UN system can and does make a difference, but it can only do so. So it's a conditional yes. It can only make that difference. And it has only made that difference when we engage to shape the norms and more importantly, demand implementation at the national level. And yes, the situated approach that you spoke about is really important because how we shape norms and how we diffuse them or implement them is very much contextual contextual within countries and also contextual between countries. As someone who has spent um, quite a long time inside the UN uh, system, I think over 22 years, it is a question that's always hovering in the corners of my mind. And my answer on the, dif on the difference, as, I, as I've said, is mostly yes. But only if I understand the UN as you understand it, as a bureaucracy, or you call it a kind of a semi-dependent agency, um, executive agency, um, as a space for, for decision-making among states, so, so consensus building among states, um, all, albeit that they do that um, always through a contestation of ideologies and power around culture, around geopolitics, and around economics. And also, if we understand that space as a place where NGOs interact and seek to have influence. So the UN is, is many things, but of course, primarily 
the amalgam of states making decisions. Um, and I think the first thing to acknowledge is that transforming gender and sex-based discrimination is deeply, deeply countercultural. So asking for rejection of values and hierarchies that are deeply beneficial to some, because of course, gender inequality does benefit some. Um, change is needed to institutions and more importantly, those institutions that shape values and behaviors, institutions, um, uh, state and non-state institutions. And I'm thinking very much right now of popular culture, social media, faith-based institutions, all of those are institutions that may not fall neatly under the, the control of the state, but all of those things, those institutions have to change to drive that cultural change that we seek um, as we make rights substantive and not just formal in the language of CEDAW. So yet I think with determination, with persistence, with a lot of solidarity, with critique and engagement, women's rights activists, Academics who are with also women's rights activists in their own way, feminist organizations, um, and, you know, and all kinds of uh, gender-based organizations have an art change in the world through their influence on the multilateral as well as national institutions. And I do think it really is where the international norms are translated at domestic level that we see the change. So the question is, as you rightly put it, where we've seen the change at the domestic level across a number of areas. Um, but we, 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 we engage with the UN system, the multilateral system, but we don't do so without resistance, without backlash, without setbacks. And it would be wholly naive to expect that patriarchal power is gonna give up without a real hard fight. It will be a fight, it has been a fight. Because as the quote goes, power does not give up without a fight and patriarchy has a lot to lose. Patriarchs, I should say, have a lot to lose including entitlements to women's time, women's labors, free labors, women's free or, or and cheapened labors and, and women's bodies. But the more we are involved with clarity and with fervor, the more likely the multilateral systems arc will bend towards gender and social justice to use the language of um, Martin Luther King. And we have many games to exactly show that that arc is bending towards gender and social justice. Uh, but it's, I suppose it's, it's like in the wind, sort of bending and bending back. Um, you know, it's, it's not just in one direction. Um, and so there is a dynamic of norm creation, norm translation, and norm incorporation, which is happening, happening as a result of what I would say is cross-cultural or cross-national or international solidarity, driven primarily by activists and activists who seek to influence uh, the state and make state change. I want to say that I was one of the 47,000 people who attended the Beijing uh, Fourth World Conference on Women, which for many remains a high watermark of international norm formation and norm formalization. Um, it was an extraordinary time and we have to remember, again, thinking about your, your um, exhortation for a situated approach we have to think that at uh, the time, the decade of the 90s was a, uh, the, the, the Beijing Conference on Women was preceded by, well, first of all, three other world conferences on women, Mexico and Copenhagen and Nairobi. And then also a series of UN conferences, all with a very strong human rights focus. So that, that, that um, uh, conference on human rights in Vienna, Vienna in 1993, the population, ICPV, in Cairo in 1994 and the Rio Conference on Environmental Sustainability 1992. A lot was happening around that time. A lot was happening with transnational solidarity and consensus building around the demands uh, on the human, international, human, international and national human rights system. And so the UN became a focus for this transnational feminist networks. Uh, and many of us benefited from that exchange and being with each other and sharing um, and sharing our issues. And, and in a lot of ways, that issue around violence against women sort of came to life in the decade of the 90s. Um, in the Caribbean, many Caribbean feminists considered um, that they had real access and could influence the, the regional preparations for that Beijing conference. Um, when we think of all those feminists who worked so closely with, uh, with what we call, then called women's desk, in the Caribbean, worked so closely with the state to make sure that there was a Caribbean position at Beijing around all those things that we are now thinking are contested. And so 
again, thinking about a situated approach, we had, had a lot of, and thinking about norms diffusion, there were a lot of ducks lying then. We had the near global ratification of CEDAW, um, globally, but also in the Caribbean. Women's organizations were connected and mobilized. We had the slogans going, women's rights and human rights. Um, you know, there was extended preparation. And we also, in that moment, at the end of the Cold War, and I think you spoke about that as well, Dr. Zwingle. So you had on one hand, kind of what Henri gets calls major power support with the US under the Clinton administration sort of at a rhetorical level, buying into the women's rights as human rights. In fact, that, that slogan is associated with Hillary Clinton, though it's, 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 not, she did, it's not hers. And then the conference was in Beijing um, and, and China's role as a host also signaled that socialist states were interested in applying the ideology of class inequality to gender issues. So, you know, some, some context for um, some of that achievement in, in Beijing. So, and a lot of things happened after that. Uh, fresh out of Beijing, the development of laws and policies to address gender-based violence. But I also want us to understand that not only the invasion happened, but also in the Latin American, the Caribbean region, we also had that Belém do Pará, uh, the, the, the negotiations around the Belém do Pará um, convention. So the whole sort of things were happening around norms creation and norms diffusion. Um, and having most countries in the Caribbean, at least 11 CARICOM countries, China ratified by Lando Power between 1994 and, 19, um, and 1999. And out of that, then the commitment, at least for the um, enactment of domestic violence legislation, some changes to sexual offenses legislation, that has that all happened, I think, in direct um, response to women's rights activism, pressing the state and the state and women's rights activists sort of having come into a common cause. Um, around violence against women. That's at the level of law and policy formulation. We'll talk a little bit later about implementation. The second kind of big area that you saw in the Caribbean, speaking specifically of the here, is a focus on gender mainstreaming. And you, you, you mentioned it already, Dr. Zwingle. Before 1995, what we had were women's desks, literally a woman behind a desk, in many cases without a budget, um, doing sort of small level programming. And the sort of the theory around gender mainstreaming, which sort of flourished in 1995 and thereafter, would be that you needed a gender machinery that had the authority and the resources to coordinate a whole of government um, approach to ensuring gender equality in, across all sectors. And that, in a lot of ways, was formally recognized in the Caribbean. Um, most countries, not all countries, transitioned from women's deaths to divisions of gender affairs, things like that. Um, and, and set up sort of focal points within ministries. There was a whole architecture that uh, developed national gender policy, the whole architecture emerged out of that, those calls for gender mainstreaming uh, that came out in 1995. Of course, with limitations, still underfunded, still without the requisite authority, um, uh, 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 uneven development over time. Now is not the time to discuss the the perils and limitations of gender mainstreaming, but just to say it was something that was, was taken up and, and demanded by uh, women's activists who then themselves became quite disillusioned with gender mainstreaming. Uh, uh, at the international level, you spoke about the women, peace and security agenda. And I think that was a, quite a big development globally. Um, women's, not only women, uh, impact of conflict on women, but also um, the entitlement and the demand for women to participate in peace building and conflict resolution. And I also want to say around that time in, 19, in the 1990s, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court um, was adopted. And that was also uh, majorly affected by a caucus of, of, of women's rights activists who sought to ensure the ending of impunity for sexual crimes in the context of conflict. Um, no, it's quite embedded in the room statute, but they again, like gender mainstream and like the laws around violence against women, the question about implementation um, of these laws and policies um, is very much present, which, which I think goes to the point that Henri Getz has, has made over and over, that you can have a progress in what she calls the high politics of state, which is transform well, changes enactment of laws and policies, but you don't necessarily change the deep politics of culture. 
So the politics of institutions that have to implement um, those laws and policies and the, and the culture of the community where you still have um, acceptance uh, and re reinforcement of harmful gender stereotypes, like the one Dr. Zwingle spoke about when she spoke about the um, people, men and women who feel men's uh, um, political leadership is more impactful than women. So you have a recreation of a culture of inequality, notwithstanding laws and policies. So having said that, notwithstanding the difficulties in implementation, these developments, I think, in the Caribbean also generated its own backlash. And we saw that quite early in the Caribbean with the refrain, what about the boys? And this otherwise very contested concept of male marginalization. And that happened pretty early in the 90s um, and certainly accelerated after the Beijing Conference on Women. And so over and over, Caribbean feminists are called upon still to respond to the issues of men and boys in what some see as passive, uh, a passive aggressive divergence of attention from structural patriarchy which we keep pointing out affects everyone, including men and boys, um, negatively, though in different ways, different degrees and to different effects. So we are all, as I say, we breathe the, the atmosphere of patriarchy and it harms everyone, even those who think it's beneficial to them. Um, so yes, so understanding what about the boys in the context of, of, of patriarchy and inequalities has been a continued continuing issue for, for women's, women's rights activists, feminists in the Caribbean, sort of trying to, um, to, 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 to reject that binary thinking has been something that we continue uh, to confront. Um, the backlash as you spoke about it and the efforts at regression are also quite apparent at the international level and unfortunately, particularly within UN processes, annually at the Commission on the Status of Women, there's contestation around women's sexual and reproductive rights, contestation around recognition of gender and sexual orientation diversities, um, and, and the consequential obligation for more robust non-discrimination guarantees. Religious fundamentalisms frame this resistance uh, to ongoing expansion and strengthening of norms around gender equality. Um, and as you say, especially uh, in the context of, of the family, threats to the family, um, um, anti-gender agendas, anti-feminists. And, and right here in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, I just want to refer the, 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 all of us to something that happened quite recently, well, in 2017, when, when the, the women's movement was supporting, driving, originally driving, and then supporting the, the move to uh, abolish child marriage. And we actually had um, someone go into the, the parliament and, and spoke about religion and said that under that religion, you know, a girl could get married as soon as she had, uh, as soon as she um, reached the age of puberty experience. Any, yeah, that was actually said. And so we saw kind of a fundamentalism also trying to insert itself in shaping the, the, um, the response to uh, uh, abolishing child marriage. Fortunately, that, that was uh, very much the exception and not the rule. And in Trinidad and Tobago, child marriage was abolished, I think, in 2018 comprehensively. So there is backlash, but again, backlash like progress is not without resistance. You know, all of these things are happening in contestation. Um, and it's really important not to become cynical about what engagement can deliver. It's also important not to be naive about what engagement can deliver. Um, so, yeah, a certain amount of uh, of realism, but certainly determination is needed. So I just want to end by saying, um, I think the, the context now is also quite challenging. This neoliberal uh, globalization has exacerbated inequalities within and between countries. It's associated with social instability and the rise of a kind of a strange conservative populism. Um, where, where women uh, can be sometimes treated as scapegoats for economic miseries uh, rather than the, you know, the, the, the true perpetrators of economic exploitation and oppression. Um, so I want to end by saying, I cannot say that we've secured irreversible gains. Ideologies are always in contestation, but in relation to the topic, your theme, Dr. Zwingle, I would say, that we are in a process of integration, um, not evaporation. Um, 
even when we have a backlash and erosion, the, 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 the dream, the vision, the determination doesn't go away. We, we all live with that determination to make the world a more equal place for women and girls, men and boys, and gender non-conforming and people. And so I would say we cannot be cynical. We have to remain inquiring. We have to remain analytical to identify the risks, the rollbacks. We have to remain vigilant and prepared to confront countervailing narratives and strategies. And we have to be prepared to influence, yes, the high politics of state to continue to do the work that we are doing on law, re law reform, institutional reform, but we also have to deepen our engagement to change the, the politics of culture. Um, and I do agree with you, Dr. Zwingel, I think that the feminist movement has to really, in its activism, which I think we're doing, so it's just to do more of it, engage in, in the largest solidarity around uh, social justice, engage with national political economies to make sense of the, the context within which we're seeking to advance a more comprehensive gender equality and social justice. Thank you very much, Justice By um, Professor Byron for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Roberta. Um, I think you've given us a very fulsome um, picture of how these themes have played out in the Caribbean. And um, I'm sure there'll be more comment um, on that as we go into the discussion. Um, so now we've come to the point where people can pose their questions um, to both Dr. Zwingle and um, to what Roberta has said. I, I know that Roberta has to leave at a certain time, but um, maybe she'll have a chance to listen to some of your feedback before then. So questions are being channeled to me. Um, I'm going to start with the first two questions. Um, the first one is a question on migration and how it may have affected the, um, what impact has it had on gender norms and um, how gender norms are complied with within societies. Uh, the questioner says that female migrants make up 48% of the international migrant stock. This was a 2020 figure. How does this phenomenon influence gender norms, um, Dr. Zwingel? And I'll give you the second question at the same time, if you would like. Um, how has, in what ways, in what ways has the um, COVID-19 COVID pandemic exacerbated gender inequalities? Are there any cases, any instances of gender equality being favorably um, affected by during the pandemic? So the person is wanting to know on the one hand um, of the degree of exacerbation and on the other hand, um, are there any instances of favorable consequences of the pandemic? So let us start with those two questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, for some reason I cannot start my video um, but I'm just going to talk. <laughs> oh, now I can start. Okay, perfect. Um, if I may, I just wanted to thank Roberta first because um, I love this. Um, you know, I gave a long term thing, but you gave a long term activist infused addition to that, which I think is always, um, you know, reinforcing those difficulties, but also the, the sort of strategic strategic patience perhaps that you need to change things in, in those com complex constellations. And I really like that you uh, displayed this, you know, cautious optimism that a, long, a lot of things have been improved. I, I, I agree with that actually. And, and I think this is also why I started with the, 
you know, you start out in an institutional context where there's no gender sensitivity whatsoever. I mean, look at what happened since then. It's amazing. I mean, a lot of fundamental things have. So thank you for that. I love that really. And for the two questions, perhaps you also want to comment on those, but uh, the things that I would say to the migration question, um, first, um, um, I think in terms of global governance, I think migration is one of the not so successful stories. I think the UN has not um, managed, and that's part of the you know, state-centeredness of, of the organization to um, create a sustainable a refugee regime. That's my perspective, okay? Because it's all about, you know, the states can decide basically if they um, um, how how they deal with refugees. I mean, you can you can declare yourself a refugee, but if a state also does that, that's a different question. So that I think is a very problematic framework. And at the same time, of course, I'm talking more of refugees here right now, but um, of migration more broadly speaking. Well, the first thing I would say is um, migration is as every you know, right? So um, by now, as you point out, the, the person who asked the question, um, men and women migrate about uh, equal um, percentages, if you put it this way. Of course, they don't migrate to the same places. They don't migrate for the same reasons. So they don't, the, the migration process doesn't necessarily look the same for them. So for example, women more often migrate to um, wealthy countries which are in need of reproductive this um, care drain um, phenomenon where many women leave their own children to care for children elsewhere, right? So we have, we have I think um, migration is a very gendered phenomenon in, in many ways, I think, um, reinforcing um, gender stereotypical divisions of labor, right? So uh, again, in a, if in a wealthy country, a woman then has the possibility because she has a migrant person taking care of her children to go to work, um, um, engage in gainful employment, that doesn't change anything in terms of gender relations and uh, reproductive labor between her and her partner or between genders in that country in general, right? So men are never the ones who um, take care of the children, so to say. So I think that's there, but of course, on the other hand, um, migration can be very empowering for women because they can take care of their families also. But it's, it's again, it's not a, it's not a only bad or only good thing. And for the COVID question, says, I think mostly the people who were already in vulnerable and marginalized positions got the worst of it. And that has affected women more than men, I think. But it's a very broad thing to say. There's, of course, a lot of male vulnerability in this, in this um, pandemic. As I've uh, mentioned at the beginning, I think the, the very strong spotlight that's shown on who does reproductive labor, who does the labor that's usually invisible, hand has shown how overworked women are and of course it has also led to um, women being much more and much higher numbers being um, becoming unemployed um, during the pandemic right so it has has had very negative effects on women but I think it has also maybe raised some some awareness which in the future let's hope that there's something that can be done with this new awareness, right? And then one other, maybe, uh, I mean, uh, another negative thing that has been very widely discussed is the increase in um, domestic violence that the pandemic has created. Um, that's terrible, and I think we cannot talk around that. There's nothing positive about that. And finally, I think, and I think this is a little, you know, more on the rhetorical level, there has been a lot of talk on how female leadership, political leadership, has been better at managing the problems with the pandemic. I think this is sometimes true, especially when um, women leaders have perhaps their own experiences um, taken into consideration of having to manage and to balance both, um, you know, family labor and, and paid labor. And, but I, I, you know, I think it's this is a little was maybe a little overemphasized, um, and I think of course. Male and female politicians have to look at that. I and mean, we cannot just say, like, let's have women leaders because they know that and they fix those kind of things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, did Roberta, did you wish to make any comment or 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 not? I just think I think if you are uh, sort of historically marginalized or experiencing discrimination, any a shock will have a differential impact. 
So yeah, so it's not all women, but certainly women, uh, poor women, women with a high burden of care, they're going to experience a dislocation as a result of migration, especially if it's informal and irregular migration. They're going to experience the, the disruptive effect of the COVID pandemic if they lose their job, if they're in a formal economy differently. So I think it's the location also, um, uh, where you are in the in the labor market, where you are also in the reproductive um, in the re re reproductive care uh, chain as well, um, yeah. But certainly, I think uh, I just want to see. There's a UN Women study which I I really I'm sure that you all have all seen it, but it's very stark because it shows that you know for a study of a number of countries in the Caribbean, um, uh, people who had very high incomes were hardly affected by COVID. Like hardly, they hardly lost any income. It was okay, they were just staying at home, but in real ways, they were not impacted. And the lower your income was, the higher your loss of income. So I think that goes to that goes to the question, if you are living with discrimination and marginalization, shocks um, affect you in a worse way, of course. Yes, and if, if you are in the informal economy, you had absolutely no protection at all for the most part. Thank you very much. Um, two questions, two other questions, um, Suzanne. Um, at some point in your lecture, I, I think I, under, I may have misunderstood, but I think you said that CEDAW, the um, convention was not initially understood as a rights instrument, but as a development tool and that its human rights um, dimensions be evolved much more later on, um, which interested me. And I, because I've always thought of it as primarily a rights instrument, number one. And number two, I would think that development and human rights go hand in hand. Um, so I just, wanted to, I just wanted you to elaborate a little bit on that statement and and maybe explain it to me a little better and then the other question I'm, I'm i'm taking the opportunity to ask these questions um because we are still waiting on some others to flow in the other one is that some years ago i was working with a group this was a, a project on um globe building global democracy and um, what global democracy in a globalized era would consist of and how to go about building democracy starting at the global level. And um, many of us in that project felt that you have to start building from within a national, you have to start building democracy from within a national space. Um, and global projects are unlikely to succeed um, and that it really depends on what democracy means within a national space, within a particular cultural space and how it's how the institutions and the practices are going to evolve from there. And when we, when we speak about global gender norms, um, is it the same thing? Is it that in the final analysis, gender equality and gender, gender norms, gender beliefs and values will always, um, what, is, what is the balance? What is the, what is the balance of the global community and what happens within a national space? How does each support the other? And um, isn't there always going to have to be in, no matter how the circumstances change and we live in a rapidly evolving world, but there's always going to have to be a struggle that takes place at the national level is the, what, you know, what is the balance between these two processes, the global level? and um, within, within a national space. I think those are the two. 
Professor, before Dr. Zwingle um, answers, I just have to leave. Um, I'm so sorry, but I just wanted to let you all know that I have to go off to the other meeting. Thank you very much for having me and I look forward to the recording. Thank you, Dr. Zwingle. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Roberta. All the best. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, to the first question, it also surprised me when I first heard that, that CEDO was first understood as a, or a sort of interpreted as a development tool because it wasn't created this way, right? It was from the get-go created as a human rights treaty and instrument, just very, very parallel to the other instruments. However, because um, most of the work that within the United Nations have far on women's issues and gender equality was in the context of development and was not done very much in the context of the human rights architecture. The other um, treaty bodies, um, also the secretariat that serviced um, those treaty bodies, they, it took them a while, honestly, to understand that this was a real human rights instrument. I mean, they, you know, I have talked a lot with CEO experts, they changes like in the 90s, in the early 90s. So throughout the 80s, nobody exactly knew what, what CEDAW actually was. It was also serviced from a different secretariat. It was very awkward, it was sort of a little bit apart, right? And I, I also, um, however, um, agree with what you said that don't um, development issues and rights hang together, right? And precisely, I mean, CEDAW, the scope of CEDAW did that. I did a lot of um, um, socioeconomic rights with a gender equality perspective and, and it's it's um, in a way bringing many different dimensions together that other treaties I think don't right perhaps the treaty on cultural and uh, economic and social rights but um, um, so it, 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 I think that's very true and I think in a way I think CEDAW also stands for a paradigm shift to say like um, if we want that the lives and the challenges that women face are fully rights framework, then we have to change the human rights framework somewhat. We have to focus much more on, you know, private relationships, um, you know, this very important Article 16 on uh, gender equality and family affairs and so forth. That was something very new at the time. So yeah, but it took a while. So the institutional integration really took a while. So they, it was a learning process, if you want, for the, for the UN. So, uh, but I think that that is, uh, um, uh, thanks for pointing this out. I, um, very surprising for me when I heard it for the first time. And then the second question, the second question about um, the balance between um, global norm creation and more bottom up and um, local and domestic norm creations in terms of gender equality. Yeah, I agree. This is um, uh, it's it's very important to sort of figure out how these hang together. Roberta talked before about constant. I mean, it's not, I mean, certainly I would never think it makes sense to think that okay, we have this framework, this global framework, and then now it has to be applied, uh, it has to just sort of implement it. it. It's not working this way, precisely because it first came out of local contexts, right? I mean, the whole debates um, on the UN level, they come from activists who brought those issues there. And those activists, and they come from lived experiences. So it's very important to keep that connection to real women and the, the real improvement of lives that we are looking for right so i think this this has to has to remain connected and i think there are very often um tensions there i mean we have this very often that um something that comes from the outside is not considered legitimate i mean look at the um, istanbul convention and the, also the resistance that's coming against it and um, from several european countries and turkey even left it right but they said in, a, in the end well this is not this is not what we do here and it also ha happens very often that global influences are an incentive and um, food for thought in a particular domestic context, and they trigger something, right? I mean, I was very, very interested, and in, I studied Finland, which Finland, many people think of as very much ahead in everything gender equality related. They honestly did not have a policy on violence against women until they, they were in, in dialogue with the CEDO committee, and then they started thinking about that. And then so it's, and I think there's many different constellations. And yeah, I think they have to wrestle with each other. 
you very much. Um, I think that has um, been very enlightening because it's a debate that we have constantly as, as to what is the value of global norms and what is the relationship between what happens at the international and at the and in the local space. There are two other questions. Um, the first one is, has the proliferation of transgenderism affected gender equality norms? And if so, in what ways? And can you take another one? Um, this, this one is returning to the main theme, integrated or evaporated. How can we map flows and contestations, keeping the tensions between transformation and containment in mind? What if we see global norms as flows which map what happens along circuits and at various scales? And what is the importance of local and regional um, developments? I think, I think that would be it on that. Is, is, is that clear? It's a big question of someone who knows what you're talking about. <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> okay. Um, so you address you address what what I, 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 right exactly. I see what I what I what thoughts I have. Um, the question on transgenderism. I think it has tremendously affected gender equality um, thinking and activism tremendously. Um, but in very, very different ways across different contexts in the world, right? Um, I'm I have been, I, I was born in Germany, I live now in the United States, so I have lived most of my life in Western states. Um, and I remember times when, you know, you were just not really equipped to think beyond a gender binary. This was the thing. And then you thought about, um, you know, the hierarchy and what could women do to um, be in a better position. And I think by now we have so much a, a broader understanding of the, the, of the fact that gender hierarchies include than the binary positions, but, you know, gender fluidity, um, gender identities that um, position themselves either as gender fluid or as, you know, trans as opposed to cisgender gender and so forth. I think for myself, and I'm, I'm considering myself a feminist who's open to those things, I think I, it, it's, it takes a while to understand those things and to understand where, where this goes, right? But I think um, in many societies, I think there's a, a big, big this now, right? Huge. Um, which doesn't mean, of course, that the lived realities of trans people is on the level of uh, cis people, right? This is a big, big um, material situation of discrimination, right? But anyway, so you have you have the start of a, of a conversation. I think within the UN or like other multilateral organizations, also it's really difficult to tackle this because you have other contexts where no such dialogues or very or, or like hostile dialogues take place, right? And you have, as you know, um, countries where um, homosexuality or transsexuality is um, a, a crime, right? So all of those things. Um, lead to the UN, I think, as a space of, of a lot of hesitance and, uh, you know, of trying to be very, um, very careful about those things. And of course, um, backlash and um, counter positions that don't want to make this official, so to say. Right? That's, that's, again, we have a tug of war here. But I think um, in the last decade, at least maybe two decades, huge, huge changes globally. And, and when I say globally here, it's perhaps more, um, you know, beyond formal politics and beyond formal institutions and more um, in, in terms of societal flows. That would be my answer to that. Um, and, and also, I think it's, it's, it's really, it's an issue that forces us all to how inclusionary our politics are, or, or perhaps how exclusionary, you know, what we can respect, accept, 
integrate and so forth. I think that's that is important. And as you know, among feminists and gender equality um, advocates, there are some people who would draw a line, right? And they would say, you know, trans women are not real women. We have heard these controversies. Okay, and the other question, um, I think it, this goes a little bit in the direction of what for, right? So, okay, we have flows. I, I agree with this, the idea of flows of norms to the degree that, that we are thinking, okay, these norms don't stay the same. They are in transformation, right? And they, um, they are particular um, um, influences that cause the transformation. It's, you know, certain activisms, it's certain contestations, it's certain oppositions, all those kind of things. It's the different scales that we also have in terms of uh, national, local um, activism and connections. And um, I think, I think it's the, the, to, to try to map this, that's possible. The question I think is, is harder to, to answer, like, you know, how, how to deal with that. I mean, how to make this the most effective in terms of substantive um, gender justice. And I think um, people who are, as yourself, um, Gabriel, um, you know, both scholars and activists are in a good position to, to develop strategies in that way. That's what I would say. I have another question which relates, which probably relates quite a bit to um, your answer to the previous question, some of the references that you made. Um, question five is, how can we promote gender equality in the Caribbean when we here are so culturally and religiously strict? Like racism, sexism is taught and the cycle of bigotry continues with every generation. Policy can only take us so far, and so does advocacy. With these things in mind, can we realistically achieve gender equality, given how complex gender inequality is as a whole? Um, and um, when I hear that question, I think of those figures. You started out by giving us some statistics which showed that um, in terms of reducing um, wage equality, wage inequalities, a plateau was reached in the 1990s and we really haven't gone in many countries, including some of the most advanced countries economically that plateau hasn't really been reduced at all. Um, so let's, let's see if I have any more. Um, yes, I have another question for you. If you have you managed to, have, to absorb that one yet? Yeah, question six. Could you address um, the move of some countries to incorporate no, I don't know what DV is. Um, domestic violence. Domestic, domestic violence, violence and gender -based right. violence. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yes, I know what GBV, domestic and gender-based violence, into their constitution or domestic violence laws and policies and essentially abandon their responsibility on the concerning the overarching CEDAW mandates. Has the focus on domestic violence and gender-based violence provided an escape route for many governments? If so, how do we maintain a balance so that the, the development of the whole woman is not lost? Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. And for the first question, the person who asked it framed it very strongly um, with their focus on the Caribbean, right? And I think it's, it's certainly a question that we can ask for many countries in the world, right? Um, as you know, I'm sure, um, that, you know, there are a lot of um, attempts to measure um, achievements in terms of gender equality, and in, uh, none of those measurements have found a country that has actually reached something to be called gender equality in a multi-factorial sense, if, if many different dimensions are considered. Of course, we have, you know, some countries that seem to look better than others, so there's, but, but I'm just saying, so there's always, 
room for improvement. And for example, the, the way the CEDAW committee looks at that, I think that's exactly the point, right? But, but you said, okay, there's these strong um, structures of bigotry and, and you know, sexism is learned. Um, yes, yes. And um, so I, I, my two answers I would have to say, number one, um, I think gender equality as a goal can be worked for even if you don't think you are reaching it right away. So in other words, there's a long sort of patience necessary that you know activists have that they, are, they, are, they make a difference between tactics and strategies so there's small steps and long-term goals right and oftentimes um the long-term goals are really really long term and you know you're perhaps not living through it right if you think about uh, the struggle for women's suffrage very very classical case if you think about it right so so long long-term perspective i think is important the other thing is i think um for the caribbean i actually see a lot of things that are supportive of gender equality also. So I mean, it's a society I think that has, as all societies in different ways, has their sort of contradictory components, right? And there are, you know, um, educational achievements of, of women in, in the Caribbean, for example, and representation in non-stereotypical um, fields of employment. I think that's, that's nothing to disregard, right? There, there's a lot of, a lot of things that um, other countries are perhaps um, envious of. I mean, that's something also to have in mind. I think, you know, if you live in a country that's not helping you because this is your country and you want it more, more just, more gender equal, that makes sense, of course. And, but for that, I think this long-term perspective of activism is very, very important. And the um, Terry's questions on the escape route of violence against women for several states, um, rather than taking on a broader perspective on working for the rights of women. Um, so, I mean, one thing, one level, on one level, I would say, of course, it's very important to deal with gender-based violence or domestic violence and to, you know, if you have, if you are a state that, that seriously and puts, um, you know, robust policies in place, that's, again, it's not nothing. However, I agree with you that it's, it doesn't make sense to single out this one phenomenon um, and disregard the others. I think this often happens because um, domestic violence can be scandalized, it can be visualized, it's something that people react to, right? Um, so that, and, and it's something that people, if it's criticized, you cannot be against it, right? So there's, there's again, the, the need to protect the vulnerable woman. So it's, it's, it has oftentimes a very stereotypical um, um, underpinning, I think. So I would very much agree with you, and this is why I find CEDAW such a useful tool that um, we really, and that's a little bit also an answer to the, the, the previous question, we really have to look at working towards gender equality and eliminating discrimination against women in a very, very interconnected way, very interconnected. It's not one thing. It's many, many things that have to be looked at at the same time. And I think um, what really has been overlooked for a very long time, because I think it's hard to scandalize, is the um, unpaid reproductive labor that women do. I think that if that was seriously tackled by societies, this would make a, would, would make a huge difference in terms of gender stereotypes, in terms of division of labor, in terms of economic and um, in terms of what children learn at home from their parents uh, or their caregivers, right? How, what it means to be a um, complete and, you know, um, acceptable woman and what it means to be a complete and acceptable man. All of those things eventually, I think, do something to reduce violence, right? It's, of course, a little bit more indirect than having a particular policy in place. But I think this is, Multifaceted to think about gender justice, and again, it's context dependent, right? In some, in some, some contexts, some dimensions are important that wouldn't be in others. But I think that's what's necessary—a very cause and um, structure-focused thinking, rather than just picking the one that sticks out the most, which is because it looks the most brutal, right? Like, like domestic violence, for example. So it's very, very, it's, it's, it demands a lot of us understand this phenomenon on of, of gender hierarchies and you know not not only between men and women.
but in, in gender as a hierarchical structure. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think, I think that um, in the Caribbean, combating gender-based violence and domestic violence has to remain a very important goal because it is such a widespread phenomenon and we have a very, very serious problem. But at the same time, um, we also have the responsibility to keep on, keep on agitating for the wider approach that you just spoke about. Um, now let's see if we have any more questions. Um, I'm sure you're getting a bit tired. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> I'm not seeing any new questions. I, I, can, are, I can see that any people more, might get tired. <laughs> are there any more questions coming up in the chat, um, Zara? I don't have access to it here. No more questions, Prof. No more questions. Well, I think that we've had a very rich discussion and um, extremely and excellent presentations, Dr. Zwingle, from yourself and also from Roberta Clark. And um, I know many of our students here at the at in, at IR um, have had a chance to to reflect a lot on courses that they did earlier or that they are doing now and um, that it will continue to influence their academic development. We have a good number of, of master's students who are pursuing their research papers, which are, which are exploring some, at some dimension of, of gender. And um, I think that the, your presentation has been very much um, appreciated. I think what I will do now since there don't seem to be any more questions, is call on Shelly-Ann Turbani, one of those same students that I'm speaking about, and shelly -Ann is going to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, um, Professor. So shelly can, can, can everyone hear? Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all. It gives me immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this event. Um, firstly, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Zwingle, for taking time to deliver this presentation. Your wealth of knowledge and expertise has definitely contributed to our edification and understanding of the topic explored today. Um, I know that Ms. Roberta Cloud had to leave us, but her time and presence certainly added value to this forum. Um, I would also like to thank Professor Byron, Director at the Institute of International Relations and her administrative staff for organizing this event that has indeed benefited the students and staff of the University of the West Indies and the wider public. Do have a good evening and be safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, and uh, once more, thank you very much, Suzanne Zwingle and Roberta Clark. And I'd like to thank my colleagues over at Gender and Development for lending you to us today. Um, it's been a great treat. And thank you to the entire audience, all of you who came. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Good evening. Bye. Bye bye.